Celtic Stuff Live. Welcome to Celtic Stuff Live on the CLNS Media Network, the leading online provider of audio and video coverage for the Boston Celtics. I'm your host, Justin Poulin. Joining me, as always, John Duke. And, John, let's just get right to the meat and potatoes. Let's let's just deal with the issues at hand. I absolutely picked every game incorrectly for this past week. Every game I said they'd lose, they won. Every game I said they'd win, they lost. So I was correct. Nailed I guess. it. I, yeah. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom. Mic drop. So I guess on, on one level – uh, I was correct that they are, I thought they were poised for a skid and considering the level of, or the caliber of, of talent on the teams that they faced this past week and the inconsistencies that we saw, certainly they are skidding even if the record was still on the winning side for the week. Yeah, I, I think, I think, you know, the, the, the two on one record was, is nice, but I think you know, you and I see this, there's some deeper issues, consistency issues, things that you and I had talked about, you know, before the season. How are they going to make this work with a team of four people returning and, and really even among those four players, one of them being a second year player, another being a third year player. I mean, a fourth year player where you're talking about Marcus Smart. I mean, the, the age, the youth, the inexperience. All these things that really worked against them. And so you, you, you look at situations this week and they had that long, that long, amazing winning streak where they pulled out these games at the end. There are also some signs there of they played great defense. They were able to do those things, but obviously they were falling behind. <laughs> A lot of those games they had to come back. So I think that the message here <laughs> Wait, is that and the well, games where they got ahead, they led the teams back in it. That's kind of oh, the yeah. same issue, correct? Sure. Well, yeah. And I, you know, I think part of it's part of the NBA season and it's the NBA. It's tough. You're going to have that, you know, where there's going to be a back and forth, but it seemed like the issues that I'm seeing kind of over and over again, it's, it's consistent defensive effort one. And then two offensively, particularly the second unit, having a clue, having a, a consistent uh, go-to player. I mean, I think we see some signs with Tatum, and I think they're maybe putting more in Tatum's hands. I'm not sure he's Brian ready to be Scalabrini's that. Brian Scalabrini's calling for it. In the very last yeah. game, all he could talk about during the broadcast, he teased it two or three times and sort mm-hmm. of said, Brad's got to figure this out. And we we're I think it was after one particular ISO play where he kind of just cross-dribbled back and forth and then went up into a shot and mm-hmm. nailed it. So – Brian's kind of saying maybe this is the cure for that second unit. They needed to, they need to figure it out. And just a few weeks ago, we were talking about how they were just such a stellar defensive squad. And I know the injury to Morris has certainly not helped, but I thought he was providing more on the offensive end for that second unit than really being the biggest difference maker defensively. But the defense has become much more inconsistent. Even, and, and some of it's just at an effort level. It's not even, doesn't seem to be right. always just communication. It's just where's the hustle. Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly right. It's, it's, it's a lot of, you know, watching that last rotation. They go, you know, someone's passed around the perimeter and, and I was just rewatching the, the Memphis game here, um, before we jumped on to do the show. You know, it's pass, pass, and Kyrie could run out and contest, but, I'm just going to point to him instead. You know, and I, yeah, I get it. I mean, look, they, they've got a bad situation for their schedule. That extra effort just isn't going to be there the way it needs to be right now. But they need to be able to pull these games out. And too often it's a point instead of a run out and a close out and force someone to, to put the ball on the floor to go buy them. I think that's, that's one instance, but I think there's a number of those instances where the effort just isn't quite there the way it was during that winning streak. I think Someone they're beat be down, expected, but it's got to get better. It's got to be, it's got to be more consistent. They're beat down and they're not just beat down because of the schedule, yeah. which you're noting. We've talked about and it's legit. It's definitely an issue. Just how many games they've played and, and this past week's schedule was really crammed in, or I should say last maybe week and a half schedule was really crammed in with games, if not quality opponents. At the same time, 
it starts to catch up with you. They're also playing much more physical against their opponents. I mean, yet another mask this week. Now Daniel Tice has to wear one, one that wasn't even fitted for him yet, which was kind of funny. But he did hit his first three-pointer wearing the mask, and I kept – it was funny leading up to that game. I go, I wonder when he's going to hit one of those because he isn't shy in taking them. Usually it's from the corner, but we've seen him even take them from a couple of other spots on the floor. He knocks one knocks one down in his first game uh, after breaking his nose. He's wearing the mask, and he drains one. It's just sort of funny. But I think that's part of it, too, is teams are gunning for the Celtics, and you know that's going to happen when you're at the top. All of a sudden, the Cleveland Cavaliers are right behind him. Toronto seems to be the team it has always been the last several years and is also hugged right in there at the top. So you look at this club, and, and I think other matchups are just be getting more physical with them. And I do think that the lack of Morris, even if that defensive effort isn't really the issue, I think just the lack of depth may be the issue where if they're all getting run down, how far can Brad really go? So the Hayward injury on its own, I don't think crippled this team, but we had questions about the bench unit to begin with. Uh, just how far they could go, how deep they could go. I think mostly we were talking offensively was the biggest concern. But I think even just from the standpoint of health and rest m- combined with, with the intense schedule, it's starting to catch up to them. This, and this, look, this is the point of the pyramid where it's gonna, it's, the pressure is gonna be at its worst, right? This is where, in terms, of, let's say he comes back, okay? And we're gonna talk more about that later on. But but let's say he does come back. It's it's going to mitigate some of those issues in terms of talent. But right now, in terms of the the, the three and four nights and the the also the heft of the schedule. I mean, they're playing Houston um, a couple days after Christmas. They're going to play Washington. They've got some good teams they're playing. It's a packed schedule. Not a lot of practice time. Not a lot of rest. You're going to have to go deeper into your rotation. You're going to have to straight, you know, kind of push that out 10, 11, 12 players. You know, that's, that's a lot to ask. And when you take away a, a max player, an all star player out of that, um, it just, it, it just, it, it's, it creates a situation where it's very difficult for them to keep doing what they're doing. I don't think it's a house of cards they have, but. I mean, honestly, that's, that may be one more component than what they really need right now. And so I, I think, you know, I don't know about you, but I look at this and say, if they can get through this stretch doing two and ones, you know, or, or, or three and ones between, or three and twos between now and mid January, I'll be content. You know, if they can just get through this winning records week after week after week, get through it, reestablish, reassess, and then kind of push forward with a different effort after the London game. I, I feel like then I'll be, I just want to get through the woods on this, you know, get through it and see how they do. I, I do think they'll get through the woods and, and this probably is the toughest part. The great news is, and I know we've talked about this several weeks ago, but that second half of the season, they'll be able to pace themselves, get into a bit of a rhythm and hopefully Hayward does come back. And like you said, we obviously have to dive into that. It's going to be pretty close to a weekly ongoing observation. I told you, Last time that I'd feel comfortable once he was completely out of any ankle support. He's essentially out of the boot, but he's still got, you know, that ankle brace support. Once that comes off and we continue to see progress, that's when I'm going to get very optimistic. But seeing him walk around on his own accord and he is putting full weight along with that brace, which isn't exactly what I even expected when we talked, that's all a really good sign. So we'll talk about that some more. But first, I want to remind everybody you can follow Celtic Stuff Live on Twitter at CSL underscore Tweet Live. You can follow me at CSL underscore Justin. John is at CSL underscore Duke. And the entire CLNS Media Network is at CLNS Media. The Facebook page is Facebook dot com slash CLNS fans and don't forget to download the media app that's right the CLNS media app for iOS and Android simply search CLNS media in your app marketplace and finally the YouTube channel youtube.com slash CLNS media for high definition full length locker room interviews and the garden report and we see uh, our owner our founder Nick Gelso uh, hosting that guard report quite often and cameos 
from the former uh, full-time host of the Garden Report, Jared Weiss, I've seen recently, talking about Hayward, as a matter of fact, as we sort of lead into that, John. But um, but I'll tell you what, I, I think maybe maybe still before we get to the Hayward thing, it all ties to this propping up the second unit. You know, the offense there is lacking. And I've also noticed that uh, Horford's uh, impact on the game, remember, he was just killing it at the beginning. But now all of a sudden, I feel like Brad's using him more and more to prop up that second unit. And then his effectiveness, at least statistically, is it's kind of dropped off. You look at the beginning of that Memphis game like you were talking about. What a great start for that team. Everything's clicking. It's working. But then when they start to go into that second unit, I feel like what Horford's able to do, just because of the cast of characters around him, it's getting diminished. And they're spreading that talent out. And ultimately, the team has reverted a lot to what it looked like last year, where they were relying on Kyrie Irving, or where they were relying on Isaiah Thomas to just get it done for them. I'm watching that happen more and more with Kyrie Irving. Not not maybe quite as bad as last year, but the ball-sharing responsibilities that we talked about three weeks ago towards the end of games and everybody kind of doing it. We still see Tatum throwing it in there, but for the most part, the team is starting to look at Kyrie and say, take us to the promised land, and I really hope that that's just a short-term fix due to fatigue. Well, I yeah... You know, I think um, I think part of it is because there haven't been enough reliable offensive players around him, and I think that that's they. You know, we know Kyrie can get buckets, right? That's that's the whole Uncle Drew thing, right? Get buckets, man. So I I think that that's kind of the it's part of the issue here is that you know if if I'm Marcus Smart, right, and I'm dribbling the ball and Kyrie's over there. Or I got Jalen Brown here, and I got you know Horford here, and Baines here. I mean, I got options, but that guy's got to give me buckets, you know, and that's what we need. I, you know, I feel like that's the problem is there isn't enough reliable scoring, and so even a guy like Al Horford, as good a player as he is, he's not a reliable scorer, and so that's, you know, they're saying we got to get scoring. This is the guy, and so you're right. It's kind of force feeding the situation. Meanwhile, we have a we have the guy who's leading the league in three point shooting who I think is underutilized. His usage is not high enough. They need to take advantage of what he is. And maybe it's baby steps. Maybe they have the training wheels on uh, Tatum. But you see some of the things he did again in the Memphis game. And I think he's he's ready for more than maybe we're giving him credit for. Is it is it good to take the training wheels off too early and force him to kind of see if what he can do? I I don't know. Maybe they don't have a choice. Maybe they have to go to that. Yeah, I definitely think that Tatum needs to. I'm not worried about taking the the training wheels off. I think it's about time. He has so much composure. I don't know what you have to to worry about. You you've seen players like Rozier and even Jalen Brown. They fall in and out of sort of composure or their ability to hit shots. But I feel like Tatum's been steady Eddie the whole way. He's made for it. And you know how much I love Brown, and I want to vault Brown right up there, but he's more of a work in progress. It's it's pretty obvious. I think Tatum's coming in with some polish, some readiness, and I don't think he's concerned at all about having to shoulder more of the load. I don't get, I don't see it. He's even passing better, and he's blocking shots. We didn't think we were going to get that from him. He's getting some good rebounds. We didn't think we were really going to get all that much from him there either. And he's contributing in so many different ways. The only concern I would have is the same concern I have for everybody else on this roster if we do that with Tatum, and that is fatigue. We've already addressed that early on. Everybody was saying, hey, Tatum's going to hit the rookie wall. You and I debated whether or not he would hit the rookie wall. He's certainly, if he is going to hit the rookie wall, he's going to hit a lot faster if his utilization rate goes up. That's just a fact. Yep, absolutely. I mean, and and right now he's... Uh, I was just about to look up how many minutes. He, so he's played right now. Oh, sorry. Sorry, this is taken. Tatum, Tatum, Tatum. He's played 975 minutes. He's actually played more minutes than any other player on the on the, on the team. <laughs> I mean, so that's, that's insane. a concern. 
That's but, insane. But his utilization is low because he's, he's out there that has with a, the starters. Exactly. Right. And he's a right. young player, so you know he can log the minutes. It's can he log the minutes with a high utilization rate? So so his 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 usage percentage is seventeen and a half right now, which is behind Kyrie, behind Horford, behind Jalen Brown, behind Smart, Rosier, uh Marcus Morris, Tice. Um, <laughs> that's just because he's on that starting unit. Well, that util- and, and but honestly, that be? usage rate, real. That's a, yes, he should still be with the starting unit. But, no, 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 no. I mean, should he be that low, even with that starting? Unit? Yeah, absolutely. Not be above, you know, in the top five at the very least. No, because the other you guys know? that are ahead of him are on that second unit, and it's been compartmentalized enough. Especially Rozier, like that's definitely not a shock. But but Jalen. Uh, even then, I think Jalen winds up getting into, you know, a lot. Like, you'll see the offense set up through Jalen a lot more at the top, right? Like, they kind of play Tatum a little bit more down low than they do with Jalen. And that's not – that means that the ball's not always going to go through him. They'll set up some ISO, and he will make his drives to the rim. But Jalen gets the same utilization, I'd say, at trying to get set up in ISO and attack the rim. But then at the same time, I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of the offense will still run through Jalen and he'll try to set it up. And I don't think they utilize Jason to set up the offense quite as much as, as Jalen Brown. So that's part of it. But I think you look at Rozier and you look at some of those other guys and I think it has a lot more to do with that second unit piece. And Tatum is not, you know, the ball is usually working through Horford and Kyrie. And then they'll probably the third person to get that ball is Jalen. So I'm not really, I mean, I'm not really that surprised. Should it go up? Yes. And I think that if you're going to log that many minutes, maybe you start to carve him out of that starting lineup and do exactly what Scal said. Maybe this is the guy that needs to get more bench minutes uh, or or minutes with that second unit coming off the bench and try to get him to get the offense going. But defense is still an issue, and he's played so, he's played very sound defense this year as well. I mean, if, if for whatever metric you believe in defensive win shares, I mean he's he he's tied for the team lead with Horford. Um, now I don't know that that you know there's a lot of different you know, metrics to use, but but he is certainly among the team's best defensive players. So it's statistically significant when he's the minutes leader too. That's the other thing. right. Exactly, and that's, and that's why I think the usage thing is important because if he's leading the team in in minutes played and his usage is still low, that something seems amiss in that alone. Just judged based upon percentages, as you said, I mean the percentages will dip, but <laughs> you miss one hundred percent of the shots you don't take, right? So if he's not able, <laughs> yeah, to but if you shoot fifty percent from beyond the arc. Then, right. uh, you make 50% of the 100 right. shots you take. <laughs> right. And yeah, I don't what know you that... need is, well, go ahead, yeah. Well, I'm just saying, maybe he doesn't continue to lead the NBA in three point percentage if that usage yeah. goes up. And maybe some of the secret sauce here with his performance is that they don't see him coming. And if his usage does go up, they'll start to strategize for him more and target him. Maybe the team is doing this on purpose to help maintain his confidence. And uh, right. just keep him on the, you know, keep him on the elevated side of things as far as, you know, how he feels about how he's playing. And defensively, too, that's what you have to learn first in this Celtics organization, and especially under Brad Stevens. He's going to want to see Tatum commit more on defense before he ever gets his shots on offense. And I think if he, if that, you just maybe gave us the hint to the answer to that question. Which is if if he's second to Horford, or you said he was tied with Horford for, for defensive, defensive wind shares? Yeah, yeah defensive wind shares. Then first, it's yeah. then maybe they look at him like they don't want him tired out on defense because they know they have some problems. But yeah. this is a guy who's contributing to that, and if he does slip on defense, regardless of what they need on offense, it could hurt the team more overall versus you know just understanding they're going to have to suffer through some of these really difficult second quarters and late thirds. 
Yeah, I, I think that he, and I, that makes a, a great deal of sense. I, I think that they have in, in Tatum, this is why the thing that you and I are doing and, and anybody else can do with their Twitter machine, you know, I, we don't know the psychology of the player. We don't know the relationship. We don't know what Brad's plan is. If, if it's, you know, to, to slowly build Tatum up to a place where he's fully unleashed in March and April. You know, th- this could be part of a, a, a much more sophisticated plan than, you know, uh, two chuckleheads here trying to talk about this on the internet. Chuckleheads. I like <laughs> it. Know, Everybody you know, else are the talking heads. We're the chuckleheads. We're the chuckleheads. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we get the jughead. So, um, I think that there is a very real sense that that's probably what, what they're doing. There, there is a plan here. There is, but he has, you know, I think broken the mold in terms of what people were expecting of him. Even, you know, Brad, you know, he's better defensively than we thought and all these things. So he comes in, he's, he's productive to the nth degree. And maybe the Memphis game is a sign of, of him being given more of the reins to run things. But that second unit, I think he can, he can help in that regard, but I think we need more on Terry Rozier. I think we need more on Marcus Smart, uh, offensively. I think that's, Fundamentally, Tatum's trajectory as a player is going to be tremendous. I mean, I think we're on the precipice of a guy who's going to be the man here for a long, long, long time and score a lot of points in a Celtics uniform. But in terms of this team and where this team is right now, Terry Rozier has got to answer some questions. Terry Rozier started off the the season looking like one of the team's top two, three four best players. And at this point, he's kind of leveled off. He kind of hasn't been the team Rose we we're expecting on a consistent basis. I think the same, I think Marcus hasn't been consistent on, you know, to that degree. And when you're getting to the end of your rookie contract, just when you and I got hopeful, be that guy. Yeah. Just when you and I got hopeful for smart, he totally slipped off again, which is really unfortunate, but r- real quick, we'll come back and dive into that a little bit more, but listen up hoops fans. Basketball season is back, and now that your favorite hardwood heroes have returned to action, it's time for you to put your fantasy knowledge to the test and win the huge cash prizes every night playing one-day fantasy basketball at DraftKings.com. At DraftKings, there are so many ways to play. Choose from public contests with huge cash prizes or private contests where you can compete against your friends. And they've even got beginner and casual contests where you'll play against people of similar of a similar skill level the best part you get to draft a new team each day and drafting a team is arguably the best part of fantasy the only thing better winning a bunch of cash doing it just ask dan from st louis or jeremy from austin they both turned in a three dollar entry and got a thousand bucks huge cash prizes and bragging rights await only at DraftKings. use the code clns at draftkings.com that is a free with your first uh deposit for a share of ten thousand dollars in total prizes that's tonight don't wait use code clns at draftkings.com Choose your lineup, and you can seriously cash in. That's code CLNS, only at DraftKings.com. The game inside the game. Minimum $5 deposit required. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. So, John, as we kind of hit the second half of the show here, um, let's talk about Smart and Rozier and how, you know, what we just said, you know, coming up on the end of these rookie contracts, it's a big year for both of them. And then we're going to talk about Hayward, but this schedule does not lighten up anymore. And we're heading into the holiday. Christmas is right around the corner. So I know there's probably going to be five games played. There's five games between tonight's game against the Pacers and a week from then, Monday night's game against the Wizards on Christmas, or Monday afternoon's game, I believe, actually, against the Wizards. So that's five games and seven nights over the holiday. This is not, there's no reprieve coming. They need these bench guys like Smart and Rozier to give them a lift. It just flat out has to happen. Yeah, they do. And, and I think that this is the time when you may start making your money. I mean, we've seen guys do it just in March and April, but if you want the real money, the real big money, the type of money that 
I think Marcus Smart is hoping to get on the on the free agent market here this summer as a restricted free agent. This is when you start adding those consistent numbers to your to your you know to your uh, resume, I suppose. And I can tell you, um, you know, I'm not uh, uh, a numerologist. Uh, you know, I'm not someone who really is. You know, proficient in these things, but you know, twenty eight point seven percent from three and thirty five percent from from two point area, um, thirty two percent in total. No one's going to be breaking the bank for Marcus Smart at that number. Uh, I just don't see it happening. Now, maybe they'll be buoyed by a great you know run, uh, but that is those are troubling numbers for him, and. <sighs> It's a shame because he's a winning player. Everyone understands that. You need guys like that on the court to win games. But those numbers are frightening, and they're not getting better. And, you know, we talked early on about, you know, well, you know, if he does this, he, he could be up around 30 and 32. And he could, I mean, it's it's just more the same. And I, and I fear that that may be who Marcus Smart is. Now, interestingly enough, Celtics played Memphis. Tyreek Evans, obviously a, a member of the Grizzlies now, a guy who notoriously could not shoot, just like Marcus Smart could. Forty-two percent from three heading into that game. No exactly. Doubt. So there is a there is a way in which Marcus can make that jump. Will he? I don't know. But look, you know, Tyreek Evans isn't playing for the team that drafted him. <laughs> if he went to Sacramento, he was in New Orleans, and you know, now he's in Memphis. Uh, You'd hate to see that happen to, to Marcus Smart, but you know he's going to have to make those those strides. And what about this tighter. experiment? What about this experiment? We've talked about it already about Smart going into that starting lineup. But if you were to do that, then I'm not saying you pull Tatum from the starting lineup, but maybe you adjust these rotations a little bit so that Tatum spends more time maybe in that early transition from first unit to second unit since he's already playing a lot of minutes have him in that starting lineup and then maybe that would free up Marcus I mean who knows what happens to Tatum if he's stuck in that second unit exclusively the way Marcus has been I know he's still a shooter and Marcus isn't and I get all of that but I'm just saying take the pressure off of Marcus the same way that the pressure is taken off of um the same way the pressure, the way the pressure is taken off of Tatum, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, I. <laughs> it, <laughs> developing you, young players is a hard thing, right? I mean, you look at the sac, the, the San Antonio game, and what Pop did in that game, playing guys. I mean, honestly, I mean, I could go grab a couple guys from the Y, and you might think, oh, I think that guy's an NBA player, or that you know. But it looks like that's what Pop does. He goes to the San Antonio Live, like, uh, yeah, hey, you and you and yeah, and then they do it, and then they find a way to build those guys up into into players and Jonathan Simmons and Dwayne Dedman and you know all these guys who have kind of come up through the Spurs way, and they figured out how to make them and real, honest to goodness NBA players. I think Boston's trying to do that. With a little bit more pedigree, a little bit higher draft picks, but I think they're they're trying to find the right ways in which you know you build a guy up and then you you give him you know a lot to do. And look at the Spurs; the Spurs are throwing these guys out there, starting these players who you wouldn't know them from Adam, you know, and they're and they're coming through. Terry Rozier with all the opportunities he's had, you know, there's a reason why he had his rookie year and didn't do much in it, had a great, you know, playoff, didn't do much during last year, had a great playoff. There's something internal that into that motor that he's got to kick in on a regular basis to be the kind of guy that he needs to be to make the big bucks. And he can do it. The, the talent is there. It's does he have the motor to, to be great every night. If you could take Marcus Smart and Terry Rozier and combine them into a player, you'd have, well, you might have Westbrook, right? I mean, just Terry's ability to shoot is phenomenal. And Marcus's ability to facilitate the offense is really excellent. 
Both of them are good defensively. Smart's obviously better, but Terry can grab those rebounds the same way Smart can. It's really too bad you couldn't combine those two into one one solid player. <laughs> it would be nice. <laughs> we need, yeah, some sort of science, some sort of GE led uh, MIT science experiment to uh, you know basically. Frankenstein, those you're together. like you're thinking weird science or something. I I know where you're going. Well, yeah, maybe not, exactly. Maybe not exactly to that movie. So yeah, <laughs> let's let's talk about Hayward, and then you know we we definitely are not going to have a show until after Christmas. So right. uh, we're at least a week. We might even take a week off during that holiday and come back at you on New Year's Day or the day after New Year's in 2018. Boy, the years are flying by. So with that in mind, let's talk about Hayward, but then let's at least look at the week to come all the way through that Christmas game against the Wizards at the minimum. Then we can play it by ear what -hmm. what we're going to do with the show. But So, you know, essentially Hayward is not ruling out a comeback, which we already knew, but there was just this whole I'm taking it day by day, I think that that right there is the switch of optimism. You know, I'm walking on this puppy. You know, I can move it around. I'm not really suffering a lot of issues, and we're not even into January yet. So it'll be interesting to see if he can start running by the end of January. And and I don't think that's out of the question. I mean, treadmill running, you know, just, you know, putting on some weight bearing and whatever, but... You know, that's still uh, the end of January. Let's say let's let's put it a little bit different. Let's say by February, let's say by the beginning of February, that's still six weeks away. Right. That's reasonable. If he can be weight bearing, I mean, I would say nobody's going to be around him. He's not going to be jumping. He's just going to be strengthening the muscles around the ankle. That's really the most critical thing right now to help prevent re-injury other than freakish scenarios landing on it sideways and, you know, the ligaments and tendons aren't all, you know, that that all takes healing. Right. Um, and everything gets kind of contracted, too. That's the other thing. He's got to maintain flexibility. He's got to get that back. But I would think six weeks is reasonable. We'll know by the beginning of February if he's got a legitimate shot of playing basketball this year. That's what I think. Yeah, I think that's right. Well, and that's it's interesting because the February 8th is the trade deadline too. So it, there's, you know, moving that back two weeks does create a bit of a problem in that, you know, well, will you know, will you not know? Is he far enough down the road where it will be close? Again, I think they're not even going to look at that position. As long as Marcus Morris is on this roster, I don't think they're looking in the front court. I think the question is, do you look at a guy like Lou Williams? Do you look at a, a center, you know, kind of to buttress the, the, the big depth up front? I don't think they look at to, to bring another wing in here with, with Morris, you know, and, and his knee being what it is, Tatum being where he is. I think they're looking really at the guard position, uh, even as well as, you know, we talked about last week, as well as Larkin has played. If you could add a guy like Lou Williams for low cost, talk about adding to that scoring issues in the second unit. I mean, he's a, he's an expiring deal. You could add him for the, the DPE and it doesn't, it doesn't bother a thing. And he's playing for a team that's going nowhere fast. So that seems to be an easy fit. Um, well, you know, well, there's a whole other issue whether you can get a deal done with that team and that GM, but that's, that's another story. But I think you're right, though. It's six weeks out. That's a long time from now. The boot's gone. There's a brace there. He's apparently doing some some work on the bike. Um, you know, there's there's he's he's standing up shooting. Um, I just I I think that there's a lot. As long as there are no major setbacks, I don't see how he doesn't come back. I just don't. I don't. What did they say the the rehab was I, supposed I, to be like six six months? So if he went out five the, five months. So yeah. the middle of March was sort of the optimistic kind of thing. And now Hayward's saying, you know, he even thinks he might be able to come back, you know, in a, on an unprecedented schedule, so to speak. Um, mm-hmm. I would think mid-March is a good timeline if everything is going well for him to start playing mm-hmm. potentially in games or practicing with games starting in April. And that's what you and I talked about. If everything went well, that we would sort of say, okay, by mid-March, he's at least practicing. By the beginning of April, he's playing in games. 
and then hopefully in limited minutes he begins to gain his conditioning back in the postseason, which is that's going to be probably the hardest thing for him. But if you look at February, let's say February he's running, he's full weight bearing, he's moving around, that still gives you yet another six weeks to get to a point where you're playing in practices. Um, that I mean, there's a lot of time here. There is a yeah. lot of time, and yeah. uh, I would I would be interested to know how ahead of schedule he is today, because I think that's what's happened. I think he's ahead of schedule today, and that's mm-hmm. where that optimism came from. Is they were like, yeah, we really didn't expect this. Maybe until like the second week or first week of January. So you're about two weeks ahead of the timeline. So this is encouraging. That may have made him be somewhat more willing to be vocal about that optimism. And, and now I'm not ruling it out. That's a, that's a really good point. I hadn't really kind of considered that. You're right. I think there's a psychological aspect. Should have come from somewhere though, right? Yeah. It doesn't, he's right. too early in this rehab to be like, just cause I got out of my boot, you know, all of a sudden I'm like, no, I think I'm going to be back, you know, this season. I, I, I feel like there's a timeline and he's aware of the timeline and yeah. he probably got ahead of it. There's a reason why everyone's speaking I don't want to say confidently, but definitely with more confidently. Just more on, confidently. On the scale, yes. they are much yes. more confident yep. in the last couple of days than they've ever been. I mean, it, it's odd to me that someone that they would throw him out for community events and the like if he wasn't in a good place. You know what I mean? Like I, that's something that it's extra for the guys on the roster, and you know maybe that's just a role that he wants to play on this team healthy or not, but usually they do that when they want to have, they want to put him out there for a reason. And I think that he is, uh, there's a reason why they put him out there to talk to the kids and be with the team when they went to the children's hospital. I mean, there's you know, a lot some of that, there. Though, some of that too has less to do with getting people ready for him to come back. A lot of that too has, I think much to do with keeping him involved that helps keep his spirits up. He feels yeah. like he's contributing to the organization. I mean, think of the size of the contract that he just signed. Any normal human being would feel enormously guilty if they only contributed five minutes of that contract, <laughs> not even a quarter. I, and I'm not saying that that everybody around Gordon wouldn't un, doesn't understand. Of course everybody understands. That yeah. doesn't matter. If you've got a high drive, you're a competitor – it's going to be very hard for you to to accept that money that's coming in on a paycheck knowing that you're not out on the floor. And so I just think that that's been probably a big struggle. So they try to get him involved with all these other things so that he is engaged. He's not at home. He feels connected. It's part of maintaining the chemistry with those fellow players that – you know, really, with that start that they had, that was a big part of it. Was the chemistry that they had formed so quickly? I will no say this: I, if the if the losing comes, like they do, hit a skid, and I think now we've got to break down these five games that are coming up. But if they do hit a losing skid, it'd be interesting to see if some dynamics in the locker room begin to form. It's easy to have great chemistry when you're kicking butt all over the league. It's another thing when you start to hit that drag a little bit and things aren't clicking and the and especially I think when the defensive effort isn't there. That's when the fingers start getting pointed. Well and I, and I think we're we've been close to that point, you know, and I and I don't know if it's the schedule will dictate, you know, and that's that's what people are looking at and pointing at, but there's been some times that there's some some cross eyed looks and some side eye looks out there and I that's, you know, Brad was as vocal as I have heard him, certainly with this team this year, after Friday night's loss to, to Utah. And I think that they heard that in part um, when they started out against Memphis on on uh, Saturday night. But then they kind of slid back in, in, in large part to their old, older ways. Yeah, the whole issue. They couldn't you sustain know? it. Even and, though they even though they heard the message, yeah. they didn't sustain the effort right. and response. They barely even lasted a quarter. Yeah. So then can they transition? Okay. Now you heard it. <laughs> you did it for 12 minutes. Can you do it for 48 now when you got to go up against, you know, Indiana and you got to go against Miami and the Knicks and you get the Bulls again. And so you've got a pretty, 
there's some playoff caliber teams you're going to play here over the first part of the week, not so much on the second half of the week. But you need to be good against all of those teams. You need you need right, to bring so, that effort. So after what's that. your what's your prediction then? Because with five minutes left in the show, we got to nail this down and get all the way yep. through to Christmas. So the Pacers on Monday night. Then they got a back to back Heat and Knicks Wednesday, Thursday, another day off. Well, Saturday is the Bulls and then Christmas against the Wizards. I, I think well, I, I think we gotta go beyond that, go to the first of the year. You know, okay. and I and I, I would say I, I would think they if this week, this is the Indiana, Miami, New York, Chicago, I think three and one this week. I think the back to back is tough with Miami and New York. Um, Indiana, yeah, the Knicks are about. beat up, dude. That I know. Team well, I'm is worried. injured in game. I'm worried game about the Miami decision. Port. I'm, I'm worried, worried about, about the, the night before. Even, okay. even with uh, them not being able to to have the big guy there, I think they go three and one. The following week, though, I think they beat the Wizards on Christmas Day. I think they lose to Houston, but they beat Charlotte. So two and one the following week, three and one this week, two and one on Christmas week. I think this Chicago, the the Christmas Day game is going to be one to remember, and I think there's going to I think Boopgate is going to come back, and it's going to get ugly, and the Morris <laughs> brothers are going to be ready to go at it. I, Man, I, I hope I hope they're playing crazy. against each other. That that <laughs> timeline that we've gotten for Marcus is is maybe just barely hitting Christmas Day, right? Didn't they say three mm-hmm. weeks, like a week ago or something? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it, it would be great if he could be back for that game. They'd certainly need the depth. Um, I I see your three and one. The Bulls definitely aren't going to do it again. That That's done. Yeah. Um, I think the Knicks are all banged up that second yeah. night of a back-to-back. I hear you being worried about the Heat. I do think the Pacers take one. They want to, they've got one to give the Celtics for sure on Monday. The Celtics still haven't quite got it together, but they're going to have a day off in between that game and the Heat game. And I think if they do get beat up by the Pacers, then they're going to pull out the Heat in response to that. And I just don't think the Knicks are healthy and or good enough to, uh, to, to make the statement the next day. I mean, obviously if Porzingis is playing, it, it puts the question mark up there, but I think they survived that. Then they get another day off and they've got a little vengeance against the Bulls. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go three and one, uh, that week as well. Um, I think they lose to the Wizards and I think they lose to Houston because Ooh. they have that previous. Listen, you never know what the, the holidays do weird things. These guys are drug out. And they're going to be trying to squeeze in family time. And if they do go three and one the week before, it's going to take a lot out of them, even though, you know, to your point, it's that second week, you know, leading up to the new year that is a little bit more taxing. But I'm going to say one and two that week. So if they beat the, if they beat the Pacers, they lose to the Heat. If they lose to the Pacers, they beat the Heat. Either way, it's a three and one, but then it's a one and two. So overall, I'm thinking hovering one game above 500 before we come back. I'm going to say they go five, four and three. And, and Houston, let, let, I mean, we need to, the Houston game right now, that's the two top teams in both conferences right now. That, yeah. that's, that's a big game. You know, it's going to get lost in the shuffle with the Christmas game and everything going on, but that could be a, a really tremendous game there uh, a couple nights after Christmas. So I'm very excited for that one. I'm really looking forward to see how a backcourt of Paul and Harden goes up against, you know, I think Kyrie and, Marcus Smart and who is Marcus going to be able to contain one of those guys and have the offensive? Not if he's not in the starting night. lineup. <laughs> oh, yeah, but down Point. the stretch, you know, Marcus yeah. always down the stretch, right? He's yeah. out there with those guys to close out games. So we'll Definitely. certainly find out that Houston game is the most exciting one on the docket for sure, though. That will that one is uh, guaranteed to entertain. Uh, although the Wizards one's right there too, but Absolutely. that's going to. Absolutely. That's going to do it for this week's show. The broadcast will be available on demand on the CLNS Media Mobile app. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at CSL underscore Justin and at CSL underscore Duke. A heartfelt thank you to everybody for tuning in. I just want to wish everybody happy holiday, happy new year, and remember that you can support the show by subscribing to Celtic Stuff Live on iTunes and Stitcher. We'd love it if you gave us a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. And for staff writer Samuel Elias, executive producer Larry H. Russell, the founder of CLNS Media, Nick Gelso, and my co-host, John Duke. I'm Justin Poulin. Thank you for listening to this week's edition of Celtic Stuff Live. 
Celtics stuff live.